but he was a logician and he was fair-minded, so we did a very fair logical analysis of skepticism. And we came to understand this distinction between academic skepticism and uh, Pyrrhonistic skepticism. Now, somebody brought up recently that maybe even academic skepticism isn't as nihilistic as, uh, as Sextus Empiricus said, or as his Benson mate would said. Fine, because you know, I want to look into that, but the main point there would be that, well, Pyrrhonistic skepticism for sure isn't, because it's empirical. You know, Sextus Empiricus had uh, written this down and for thousands of years had been on paper as, uh, or parchment or whatever, as a, a philosophy that believed in evidence. So as we did this, I, I came to understand that I learned through my college career that I did have a tradition. Whereas at 18, I thought philosophy was bullshit and I wasn't finding you know, more tangible principles to go on than what the philosophers tried to argue out of self-causes and this kind of ridiculous non-materialist argument. And I came from that point to realizing, oh, I had reduced the philosophy from natural philosophy that they had actually taken consciously from skepticism. So the skepticism went into science, I drew it from science thinking I was just drawing it from, as if scientists had invented logic really, as if scientists had invented these ideas that they were using and I just wanted to deduce them because it was as if scientists were not philosophers but they just worked on all these tools and it took a philosopher to go and say well what is the meaning of these tools and it's really ironic because in the history of science, you know, I took a history of science, and, um, you know, it wasn't like that at all. Um, it, up until the modern standard era of physics, the natural philosophers had drawn lots of philosophical conclusions, like determinism. They believed in determinism. Their classical model was very much still a part of philosophy, and they were very willing to take what they learned from nature and apply it to philosophy in general, and all philosophy should be about nature in that sense. And uh, the problem was, they were wrong. The world wasn't determinist. They had paradigm shifts that they had to face when, you know, in the 1900s, the standard model came around. So by the time I was learning, they didn't say philosophy. Even if they were telling you something like the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, um, you know, they wouldn't tell you philosophically what it meant. I mean, I had a professor say specifically, well, we say that the waveform collapses, but that's all bullshit. That's just so we can say something about that area. The only thing we really want to talk about is our mathematical predictions and how these work. And it was a big cop-out that they did because they got burnt so much. And that helped me be confused because if you go to the scientists and say, what's the philosophy of science? They really stand offish about it. But um, it turns out they could have. If they studied the history of science, they would have said, well, we got these principles from natural philosophy. and." We don't necessarily believe in them, you know, in ontological reality, blah, blah, blah. And what they would have been telling me is the skeptical philosophy, because that's how skeptics are. You ask them, how is stuff? What's it really mean? Look, gravitation, what's it really mean? Quantum mechanics, what's it really mean? And the default skeptic uh, answer is, well, we don't know what it means, but it looks like it means something like this. And, or we could do process of elimination. Don't know what it means, but it can't mean this, you know. So... Yeah, so, you know, the science, uh, the science education I got is still very important to me. I, I draw on that in my life and in my philosophy. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, chances to do things there that you don't normally get to do, even without finishing a degree in that. For example, you know, I, had, I, per I have performed the Michelson Morley experiment that proves there is no ether as theorized at one point. And I've done a lot of types of things like that in the lab. I've had the chance to do uh, mathematically rigorous, uh, if, uh, if introductory, uh, classes in quantum mechanics. I have, I have a pretty good understanding for a philosopher of those issues because I did rigorous coursework. And I would say the same thing with logic. Because while I rejected my philosophical education to a large degree, I mean, I found a lot of philosophers said all sorts of things, and I've never found a philosopher that I would just take their whole philosophy and go, yeah, I believe in that. Pyrrho is the closest one, but only because it's a foundation, because he said, agree to the evidence. But this was an ancient argument where he was arguing against Stoics and Epicureans and people that they already thought they had all the knowledge. So he spent a lot of his time saying they're wrong. 
and they're wrong about that it's objective and they're wrong in, in some of the facts and the way they think about knowledge. I do agree with all of that, but it's just sort of limited because after that what you have to do is start building knowledge on skepticism and that didn't really happen for 2,000 years, about 1,700 years or so after uh, you had Pyrrhonism, you had modern physics actually get going with the, with the Pyrrhonistic epistemology. So, you know, there's no philosopher that I really uh, uh, agree with, you know, wholeheartedly. But I did agree with the tools I was learning, intentional, extensional analysis, and this sort of thing. <coughs> so that's my philosophical background. And uh, I don't think it lets credence to my, uh, to my arguments at all, but on the other hand, it does indirectly um, influence them because I learn certain tools. I think if somebody has a PhD, if somebody out there has a PhD and they're smarter than me, and I accept both of those things, I'll say, hey, you are better educated than me and you're smarter than me. It won't mean I believe that what they have to say because I know there's another smart PhD that's willing to contradict them. And we just have to deal with the ideas. But I would say I would have certain expectations for somebody that learned a PhD. I would expect them to know certain reference points. I could jump to a deeper argument with somebody, uh, not necessarily deeper, more insightful, but deeper technical terms. Because it could be deeper like into metaphysics where I think it's bullshit and, and the PhD can have an extra strong belief in that because they've been trained and trained and trained by smart people to believe it. And I'm not going to give in to somebody because of the level of their education or even if they're smarter than me. I know that there's, we can find counter arguments and I know we can base our discussion on the facts. And I did not get a PhD. That means that I'm not formally trained to share my knowledge as an educator. And I don't want to. I want to have conversations. Um, my education did help me, edu you know, help teach me how to research, uh, how to try to formally state my, uh, my arguments. I was taught how to diagram any concept. Um, plus, this whole time I was working as a programmer, uh, working my way through college and as a programmer, and I still work as a programmer. And I use this, these tools as well in that. I, in, in programming, you do a, logic, a lot of logical analysis, and sure enough, you have to be able to graph just about any idea. Why? Because a program can be about anything. If you're writing a medical uh, a program for the medical industry, or a game program, or, or a banking program, these bring you to very different problem domains, and you'll have to, do, you'll have to graph ideas if, from those problem domains. And it was very useful. And uh, so those kinds of tools I did learn, you know, or there's things, I'm going to make a video about what I consider the epistemic uh, method, the, the basic, the most generalized version of the scientific method. I'm going to talk about that some more. And I'm going to do that um, from the point of view of um, um, of, uh, of this uh, of physics and the skeptical philosophy. How do you how do you draw knowledge? And that is going to come from you know my experiences in in philosophy and science education. And I'm going to use tools. For example, in philosophy, I learned the the meaning of an intentional definition and an extensional definition. And my most general epistemic uh, uh, method has to do with something I call extensional definition. And it's based on the fact that. Uh, we get we have pattern recognition uh, hardware. We start making these uh, collections of similar patterns. Those are the extensions, and science is really a careful way of working with those impressions. And empiricism is an analogous, but not necessarily a strictly careful way of working with those impressions. Um, and uh, that's how it all traces back to perception. And this stuff is influenced by my education. I don't have the idea about all that stuff that they tried to indoctrinate me with in school, but I did learn all the tools and the ways of discussing and the ways of thinking about it and drew my own conclusions. So yeah, I'm not going to tell people my education when they ask, and if they say, oh, you're, are you even educated, have you ever read a book on this subject, I'm, not, I'm going to tell them the same thing I say now, I'm going to say that doesn't matter, if you can't argue the ideas, you're lame. But for the people that have watched me more, you know, people that have been watching, that are watching me now and have been watching me for a while. I think there's a framework that they can put this knowledge into and hopefully it's somewhat useful uh, or slightly interesting. 
and gives a, a frame of reference. 